All righty ho. So welcome Jordan Goldstein to the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. It's it's so good to have you on the show. I'm I'm really, really excited about our conversation today. Well, thank you so much, brother, for having me. It's always a great time to talk to you. And I'm just excited that we get to share our conversation uh, with all the people out there. Yeah, cool, man. So so you live from the farm in Ontario, Can Canada. It's flipping cold there right now. I can imagine. Yeah. Pro probably warm for you though, bud. It's been a warm winter. Uh, last winter, last last January was extremely cold. So this winter has been warm, but we got a foot and a half of snow last night. Uh, so it's finally feeling, feeling, feeling like winter. Yeah. Um, for, for those out there who know the geography of Ontario, I live about uh, 60 miles northwest of the city of Toronto up in the Niagara Escarpment. So beautiful, beautiful place. Nice and cold. Uh, nice and away from the cities. <laughs> yeah, happy days, man. Happy days. I love seeing your photos every single morning from the farm that you post on Twitter. I think it's uh, you just have moved into such a beautiful place. I think it was a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. We were living in the city. We were living in Toronto for a little bit. Uh, I always wanted to get out. Um, we needed to find a place that was kind of like in between where I worked, where I was going to commute from, and where my wife was going to commute uh, to. Whoops. And uh, that led us here. Something just happened with my chair. Just fell right off. <laughs> you broke I'm, your, I'm, I'm your arm wrist. I'm, I'm strong. I'm stronger than I think. What can I say? You know, it's like, uh, but no, it's, uh, it, 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 it's an amazing place because one of the things when you're like a city slicker and you move out into a rural area, you're just like, how am I going to meet anybody or what am I going to do? Right. Um, but we live in a, in a beautiful place with a really nice tight knit community. Um, there's lots of people kind of our age with young kids. Uh, we got kind of like that neighborhood vibe on our street where kids will kind of like run through the backyards and go and play on each other's equipment. Um, there are the horses back there. So, you know, it, it, it's a really special place to be able to raise children. And I think my wife and I are very lucky um, to be, to be able to do that, um, to give our kids the proximity to nature, the experience of like a nice small tight knit community. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful place it was our, it was our oasis in the insanity uh, that, that has been living in Canada over the past three years. That's that, that's for sure. Yeah. But it looks like it. Yeah. That's so cool, man. It's so great that you do that for your kids. So we actually met, um, well, we, we, we became mates on Twitter. I think I started following you somehow. And then uh, we did a group coaching together uh with through zach hommel and um i just want to like start off by saying like thank you to you you know like i we each at the start of the first call we were like talking about like why we are doing the coaching and that sort of stuff and i was like yeah i feel a little bit isolated where i am in brazil and um you know a few other reasons and then you were like hey and you start you literally like you went hey i hear you brother um because i was the same last year here in canada and um you know, you really kind of just made me feel super welcome. And, and ever since then, like, it feels like we are, you know, brothers, but, and, 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 and mates, you know, even though we've kind of never met, which is, which is really, really cool, isn't it? It is. It's an, it's, it, it's an amazing thing that can happen online when you approach it with the right attitude. Um, especially when you're isolated, not just like from other people, but from like the culture of the place that you're of your living in. Um, like I, I found, I found an immense value in those groups in those Zach Hummel groups. I was in a couple before the one that, that we were in because I couldn't talk to anybody about what I was struggling with, with the vaccine mandates coming down hard and on Canada uh, in the fall of 2021, I was kicked out of public establishments. Uh, I had to fight for my job. Like, uh, I had to fight against the university. Uh, they had a, a a nasty vaccine mandate they imposed on us. Family members re refused to see me. Friends not supporting me. It was bad. I didn't have anybody to talk to. And it's like the person who you think you might be able to talk to could just turn around and be another enemy. And after you've gone through that so many times, you just don't want to do it. It's like, I can't stand losing another friend today. I can't stand having another neighbor come down hard on me. And so you just, you become a hermit. 
Uh, and so the, the Hummel groups were amazing for me because here were a group of guys that I could just say, Hey, this stuff is happening to me. And I wasn't even like looking for sympathy or anything. I just needed to talk. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, what's happening to you is really wrong, man. Like, we're so sorry um, that this is going on and the way you're handling this boy, is it ever inspiring to us and if you're like down on the mat, think of like a boxing match or whatever. It's like, I'm down on the mat and the, the referee is counting to nine. Um, and, and all of a sudden it's like these, these, these angels, these guardian angels come in, they swoop in and they pick you up. And all of a sudden it's like, you've got life, you've got life again. And when I heard your story, your story was also pretty incredible to me. The idea that you were just traveling with your wife, you were kind of like, making plans to go live uh, it was portugal right That's making right. plans to go live in portugal but you got stuck in brazil like <laughs> in 2020 so so it's not even like you're in your own area and things are going wrong it's like you're completely isolated and now you you and your wife can't travel because you know you don't want to comply or, or or whatever so you're legitimately stuck in a foreign country and to me i just thought oh my gosh like I know a little bit of what, what it feels like to be isolated, but, but Gareth must be like, Oh my goodness. So I remember, I remember that call. I think I, I think I, cause we all had our phone numbers where right? I think I texted you like immediately right after you said that I was like, we need to get on a call you and me to talk about this. Uh, also you're, you're, you're another Commonwealth guy. Like we were the only two people who weren't Yankees uh, who weren't <laughs> Americans in that group. So I had a, every, uh, just, just the funny thing, and, and this is something I explain to people. So it's just the funny thing of like adding like friend or buddy or guy at the end of everything. You there's such a commonwealth thing. And the second I heard you speak, I was like, oh, this is one of my guys. Like this is this is this is my guy. He speaks our kind of like commonwealth British language. And uh and and so I was just really drawn to you for the for those for those reasons. Um, but you're right about the importance of this community and the, this ability to find support outside of the proximate place where you live through the power of the internet. Um, it makes the world seem a little bit smaller when you can connect with people all across the world who sh not only share like the same struggles, but who have like the same approach, the same perspective and who you can really learn from uh, just, just through con to conversation um so really the online the online space gets a lot of flack uh especially social media because people they use it incorrectly um but in terms of networking and finding an incredibly powerful circle of support social media was huge for me um and and huge for us i think for sure 100 percent. yeah i feel like over the years i've had this kind of Oh, I used to like love social media, right? And I used to like always post everything there. Like I'm, you know, like, like just have, I'm just enjoying life. You know, I'm not like trying to prove anything. I'm just like, cool, this is, this is my life. And then about three years ago, my, or even longer, maybe my wife and I went on a round the world trip and I was like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm not really going to post anything about our trip and I'm just going to sort of take a step back. And, um, and yeah, like I haven't really posted much, much in, in, in a long time, but there is definitely, um, this kind of love hate relationship with it. Cause you, you like don't necessarily want to say like all your data and everything with um, say these big tech companies and stuff. But then at the same time, you, you want to be inspiring and you want to sort of help other people. Um, but then you also want to use it because of the, these reasons, like you say, a community, finding people that you have uh, commonalities with, et cetera, et cetera. So, so yeah, but using it wisely is, is the important thing, I think. Yeah, it's like a tool. It's like any it's like any tool. It can be used for good or it can be used for bad. The problem is it's very new. Like social media is a novel tool. It's been around for what, like 15 years and really kind of like like a decade or so for 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 most for most people. So it's we're all kind of figuring it out in the dark, right? Like we don't really know what the capability of it is. We don't know what it's going to hold for the future. Uh, and so we're now in this like exploratory phase and most people use it for the wrong, for the wrong reasons. They use it for vanity. They use it for hate following or hate posting. They, they argue with people online. Um, and I, it's kind of, I guess how I started on social media, maybe like I, I, I never had a personal social media account. I hated the idea of it. Uh, but I was kind of like forced onto it, um, by circumstances, um, 
I had to get a Twitter account for one of my graduate school classes in 2009. Um, and all we had to do was post things related to sort of like history and stuff like that. Um, it was a digital history course. Um, so I had this account, didn't do anything with it. And then there was all the free speech stuff that was going crazy on North American campuses in 2015 and 16, and then came to Canada in 2017. Um, and I saw the, the power of social media in combating bad ideas and providing good example. Um, and also the idea that academics and professors sh should kind of be out on social media, um, uh, spreading their knowledge and, and inspiring people. You know, I was pretty, I was pretty influenced by Jordan Peterson or, around like the 2017, just seeing what, what he was doing. This was kind of before he was a big international sensation and he was more just like a homegrown Canadian academic who was standing up for sort of like ideas of free speech in the, in the academy. And he was talking about, I, I remember this is like when I lecture, I'm lecturing to like a hundred people, but when I put my lectures on YouTube, they get a they get hundreds of thousands of views. And I thought, wow, like that's a really excellent, it's a really excellent point. Like you can, you can really reach people. So I started just like posting things about like exercise and mind, body and spirit connection um, with just the idea of spreading a message. And then things went crazy uh, for me because in the fall of 2017, I was working at a university that became the center of the international free speech controversies at campus. And it involved Jordan Peterson and a graduate student named Lindsay Shepard. So if anybody out there remembers it, it's five years ago now, I'm like oh, more than five years ago. But um, if you remember, there was a grad student who got reprimanded for playing a, a video clip of a Jordan Peterson debate on public access television. Uh, and she was brought into like a, this horrifying Maoist struggle session with her professors and the, and a bureaucrat from the diversity, equity, and inclusion office. And they basically said, because you didn't denounce Jordan Peterson and you asked the students to make up their own mind on the decision on, on the debate that these, these two people were having, um, you know, you've created, you basically, you've committed a hate crime. You've broken federal law. Um, you go against everything that apart, like they just, it was, it was despicable. Uh, and then the, she brilliantly recorded it and sent it to the media. I remember it. I remember the day I saw it in the newspaper, November 11th, 2017, because my friend and I were going to see a talk by Jordan Peterson no that way. day. Oh, dude, it's crazy. Like, we we were. I, I was in Toronto. I, I woke up and and I saw the, the newspaper and I was like, I know what he's talking about today. And that's all he did was he read the newspaper article uh, for for his for his speech. Um, it was it, the 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 synchronicity or like the serendipitous nature of all of this was never lost on me. I thought this was just wild um, to find myself kind of like at this at this spot. So then social media became a place for me to 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 support the student and to tell everybody what was going on at that this university at Wilfrid Laurier University in Ontario. And I spent a year arguing with woke professors and getting into all those heated arguments. That's like, you're replying so fast. It's like um, an hour, an hour and a half goes by. You don't even realize it. And then you lo look up and you're kind of like sweating and your heart rate is you're, you're up. Cause it's like conflict. And I just remember going through a couple of those like episodes and being like, I got to take a shower. I feel dirty. Like, I don't feel, I don't feel good about any of this stuff, but there was a use to it because I was exposing the, the terrible thought patterns of these profs and I was embarrassing them. Uh, and that's sort of like what grew my, my following on social media um, and initially, but I didn't like that. I knew that I could get, lots of followers quickly if i just engaged in these silly debates not not silly but just like un unproductive you know it's like you're never changing the mind of the other people but what you do is you show the people that are reading what a good argument is versus a bad or versus, versus a bad ar argument and i wasn't enjoying it and it was taking away from my fam from my family life and 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 so i i, I put social media down for a while after that
um, but then returned returned to to spread the message uh, that I that I do now on social media um, as a way to grow an opportunity to make money outside of the university when it became clear that I didn't have a future um, inside of it. Yeah, wow, but well, I'm I'm glad that uh, there's people out there like yourself who are providing resistance to some of this craziness uh, that is going on around the world, you know, um, especially, you know, the indoctrination of, of university students. So I'm glad that you are like a very moralistic person and, and a strong guy, you know, the world needs, uh, needs strong men, that's for sure. Um, so, so, but I want to just go back a little bit in your story, but um, something cool that, that I heard you talking about on, on one of your podcasts um, that, that you were on, and uh, you you mentioned that uh, your your family is like quite a sporty family, and that your your old man is actually pretty good at table tennis. Um, yeah. Can you can you tell us a, a couple of stories about some table tennis matches with your with your old man? <laughs> well, the the stories all end the same. They all end with like humiliation and embarrassment because my family was like a competing family. It's like you play to win. Um, you don't like. It, not in a mean spirited way, but just in like, a, we like games and we like to compete with each other and we like to have fun. And so we had a big ping pong table in our, in our basement and we would practice. Like I would just try to get good enough that I could get a point off the guy and he would never let me, or he would, <laughs> he'd do like that really mean thing where he would like play dummy and he'd let you get like 15 points in a row just for fun. And then he'd just embarrass you like 21 down. Right. Like, he would play wrong handed. He would play like all the strange grips. Like he would just do anything, but he was so good. You just couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't do anything. So like thinking about it, thinking about it now, it's like, it's really neat to be able to see like one of your parents so proficient at a physical skill because you know, like what had to go into it. And in terms of like, the practice, the competition. And he told me he got so good because he had an older brother and the older brother was it's a typical older brother, like punched down on the little guy. So it was like getting good at table tennis was his way to like take out big brother. Right. So just, they used to have all these, these, these crazy matches. And whenever we would get together, like our families, like, that would be one of the things that would that would kind of happen. Like they had a ping pong table in their basement. We had one in ours. So it becomes this kind of fun thing to like orient family time around. It's like, I'm never going to beat him, but if I practice hard, maybe I'll get a little bit better. And, and, and so it just breathes in that kind of understanding of like the hard work that goes into doing something well. Um, it seems silly when you're talking about like, just like, not like non-competitive table tennis matches in the basement, but, but ultimately like those are the building blocks, like, like those are the building blocks um, of life. Like I, I think there was a tweet or something a while ago is like, what's the best advice like that your, your dad ever gave you. And I'm, I was like, Oh, that's a really good question. Like, what is it? And I don't know if there was ever like a, a phrase or a saying where I was like, oh, that's it. But it was always like the example of the actions and the behaviors that I think made the biggest impact on me. Like a cliched quote, there's like a million of those, but it's more like, how do you act in, how do you act day in, day out? What are the lessons that you're imparting through your actions and behavior? Like to me, those like early lessons in the basement carry way more weight than a cliched quote that might 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 be said at like a you know like a, a like a Hollywood script moment or something, which is what most people think about. It's like, oh, I was down, and my old man came, and he 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 told me these words, and he brought me up, and it's like, well, those ha that, that that happened, that happened, but it was never vivid enough. What's vivid are those memories. Like, what's vivid are those examples. What's vivid are like. Are, are, are the behaviors and I think just like not letting us win was a huge lesson just like I'm really good you're not good here's what it takes to get good if you want to beat me come after me and I've I've kind of like taken that attitude a little bit with my kids where if she want my my daughter wants to run a race with me I'm winning. I'm winning like every time and not because like I want to be mean or like I want to like point down and be like listen I'm fast, but <laughs> I want, but I want you to beat me. And I don't want 
me i don't want it because i'm slowing down i want it because you overtook me like i want i want to motivate i want to motivate them to become better than me and i can't do that if i lower my standard and what i do and it seems silly like to to put that on like a four-year-old but i again i just think i think those lessons are really valuable like there's so there's there's too much there's too much weakness in modern parenting like when the kid is uncomfortable or when the kid is upset like we just rush in and comfort them or we rush in to make the problem go away. And that just handicaps them. They never learn how to work through their emotions. They never learn how to problem solve, right? You're always getting in there and figuring it out for them. We have all these adults walking around like who can't handle, who can't even handle the basic responsibilities of adult. They created the word adulting to come like to talk about like doing the dishes or the laundry or like like just the basic responsibilities of making sure your house your house runs as an adult and and just these basic day-to-day tasks are so heavy for people because they ain't never had to solve a problem in their lives right or they never had to feel the sting of oops i didn't i didn't measure up today i gotta get i gotta get better so so yeah i don't like make my daughter cry on purpose or like when i beat her in a race and she cries and i turn around and i laugh at her i'm like ah, ha, ha, like you slow poke like it's not like it's not like it's not like that at all right it's a lesson that life's not fair life is tough and if you want to do well you got to work hard at whatever it is that you want to do and she gets she gets it and i hear it from her mouth every once in a while and it just makes me makes me really proud um and it makes those harder lessons kind of kind of kind of worth it. Um, a little bit of discomfort in the immediate time pays off big time down the road, as opposed to never allowing that a little bit of discomfort to be felt or or, or experienced. That's a lot of talk from a from a good question on ping pong there, eh? Yeah, I'll bet. I like where you went with it. <laughs> you see the influence your dad had on you there, hey? <laughs> so um I and I, I totally agree, but um I think um, we are, we're scared to sort of um, um, discipline our kids maybe, you know, and, and that doesn't work at all. Like you, you have to prepare your kids for the the real world and, and the real world is a flipping dog eat dog world. You know, it doesn't matter what anyone says, like it's, it's each man and woman for, for themselves basically, you know? So, so if you just sort of molly coddle your children, you're actually really not helping them. You know, it's, um, it's like you said, it's actually a bit of short-term pain for, for long-term gain, you know, and, and it's, it's in their best interests. So, so yeah, and I really like that, but uh, you, you actually, you're, you're a really sort of inspiring guy in terms of like, how you motivate yourself and um every single morning I, I see you like posting on on twitter you you're doing your your wim hof breathing uh in like minus six or whatever minus 20 <laughs> degrees outside with your shirts off and i'm like this guy is crazy <laughs> but it's good i like it it's that mental toughness you know and then you you also uh every i don't know if it's every single day or, or mostly on weekends now you're doing these these like long trail runs in your kind of like beautiful surroundings um and I, and I guess that's uh, that's the mental toughness that's sort of like followed on into you, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you talk about like the lessons from your parents. Like my dad is a very strong-willed individual, like very, very strong, very, very strong will, very determined. So that's just part of my my character. Uh, this sort of like contrarian idea. You tell me to run in one direction and I'll walk in the other direction just to spite you. You know what I mean? Like, just because I don't want to go along with it, um, which is a good thing and a bad thing, of course. Like there's a strength and a weakness to that kind of a a, a natural disposition. Um, but you get soft. You get soft over time if you're not exposing yourself to those challenges, like getting beat down at ping pong in the basement, like, that 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 that's a bit of a hard knock like but when you're a young adult one of the things that young adults don't do is continue to learn those hard lessons like we just think this is our time to party this is our time to get comfortable this is our time to experience life or whatever um and then you end up getting you end up getting soft um and so the physical is the thing that brought that mental toughness back to me um and it wasn't something i was consciously doing it was more just i had an idea I, I grew up as a very sporty kid um but then i moved away from sports and moved into music uh in my sort of 
late teens and early 20s. Um, but I always knew that by the age of 30, and this was always something I put in my mind, is like by the age of 30, like I'm gonna get I'm gonna be in good shape. Like I'm gonna get fit and I'm gonna be athletic again. Like that's just because I know that that's a big part of who I am and and what I like to do. And I know physical health is important and I want to be or I want to be a good dad for my kids and all all these things. Um and so I, I don't like the gym. I don't like exercise. Like I, I, it's not something I enjoy to do, but I understand the utility of doing it. And so this was what, like about 10 years ago now, I started to just try out different kinds of exercise. Um, when I was growing up, I was a high level soccer player. So running was something that just came very natural to me. So um, I, I'm like, hey, I just need a pair of running shoes. I can just go whenever I want. Uh, one of the reasons I don't like a gym is like having to go and wait for someone to use the machine that I want to wait. And then it just ruins my flow. And then I get angry and it's just like, no, no, no. I just, and I don't have, I shouldn't have that expectation if I'm going to a gym, it's a public gym, like the equipment's there, everybody can use it. So, um, so running is very easy. There's a very low barrier to, to start. Um, so I just started running around like my, my, the city that I was living in. And one of my friends suggested, Hey, uh, why don't you go out to this um, provincial park just outside the city and go run in the forest? And I thought, well, that's an amazing idea. I, I love that because I love nature. I love hiking. Um, but I never thought to like combine the two together. And the moment I started running on that trail, I was hooked like instantaneously. It was so hard. Uh, like I can run on a flat road or a treadmill. I could run forever still even after years of not being fit just because of all the running you do you have to do in soccer i barely made it two kilometers on this trail and i was dying like the the way the dynamism of all your steps the way you've got to move every single muscle in your body like there were muscles i didn't know existed that were telling me i'm sore or i'm hurting right now right and i just got absolutely hooked because it was so difficult but yet something was is like something is is kind of like stirred up inside you when you're in nature, just generally speaking. But when you're exerting yourself in nature, like there's a whole different level. There's a whole different level. And we can get into maybe the evolutionary roots of that. Uh, but but I believe it's something that's deep inside of us. It's deep inside our DNA. It's deep inside our collective history as, as human beings. That's the story of our survival is exertion in nature, right? If you think about persistence hunting and what we had to do to survive out on the plains, right? Um and so I, I knew about those things uh, through my research and what I was sort of studying uh, as a PhD student. And I just like, yeah, it just created this love uh, of trail running. And so I've been doing that for, my gosh, close to a decade now. Um, but you make a good point about the winter, right? There's something else about the winter that forces mental toughness in you. And it can only really be done through the physical, right? And it's similar to what we were just talking about in terms of like um, your kid, right? Exposing your kid to a little bit of discomfort now in order to have long, long, long-term gains in, in the future. It's the same thing with physical exercise, right? It's like you lift the weights because it's not easy to lift the weights, but you do it because you want like to have strong bones uh, when you go or you, it's, it, it, it hurts your lungs to go on a run, but then you improve your cardiovascular health, right? So that you have a good heart for the rest of your life. Um, that's what the winter does. Like the winter just amplifies this because it's that discomfort that creates the mental fortitude, right? It's the adversity that you go through. It's the, I got one mile left on my run and I just want to walk, but I'm going to finish it out. Right. And I'm actually going to start, I'm actually going to finish my run faster than when I started it. You know what I mean? Um, and you do that consistently, you start to believe in yourself. And then you've got this mental fortitude, this mental strength to face the other challenges that get thrown at you in life. And that's really what the winter does. I was literally just thinking about this outside. Um, as I was scraping ice off of my car, I'm like, everything in the winter is just a little bit more difficult. Like just getting my kids out of the door to go to school today was tough because they canceled the buses because there's snow i have to shovel my i have to shovel my my walkway just to get to my car then when i get to my car i gotta brush off the snow i gotta scrape off ice all this just takes an extra like 30 minutes of your day just to get from your door to your car so everything in the winter is just a little bit more difficult and it breaks people it breaks them but for me this is a chance to become stronger it's a chance to 
to look at all of these different things as challenges, right? It's a challenge to then manage my time better so that we're not rushing in the morning, right? And when it comes to the uncomfort, uh, the discomfort of like the coldness or the snow, man, like you don't get a better opera. Mother nature gives you the opportunity to go out and test yourself, right? It's the season. Like the winter is to me is like, it's almost like the season of rebirth. If you think about like the darkest, the darkest day of the year is the, the day before the winter, right? And then every single day of the winter, light comes back. It's, 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 there's, there's more day, there's more, there's more daylight. There's this like almost regenerative, regenerative process of the winter that's occurring underneath the snow, right? Because when spring happens, you're like, oh my gosh, like all this stuff, where did it come from? Well, it's because it's been getting ready. It's been getting ready underneath the snow. So that's what I do. It's like, this, the winter is a chance to build that mental fortitude that's going to get you through the rest of the year. Because if you can go out in the morning and sit in the snow with no clothes on for two minutes, it's just, what's the spring? What's the summer? What's the winter? What's the fall? Like all these other seasons become that much more easier to deal with because there's other adversity that's going to come. Uh, and so really I, I view the winter as like the ultimate mental training ground because everything is just a little bit more difficult. And if you think about it as like preparing yourself, well, then you end up seeing the beauty of the season and you actually want the snow to come because you realize like when it's, when it's gone, I'm going to be a real tough, I'm going to be a real tough SOB because I just embraced, I embraced it all. And just to keep going on that, like as a Canadian, this is a big part of one of the reasons I love this country is because no matter if you are indigenous, like the people that lived here before the British and the French came, whether you were a British or a French settler, whether you're an immigrant who came from like a hot, a nice temperate, like third world, whatever, everybody who's inhabited this land has to deal with the harshness of living here. It's the one thing that bonds us all together, despite time, or like culture or background or what or language or whatever everybody who lives in this land survives through the harshness of the seasons and the harshness of just living of 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 living here and it was at sort of like that time I was discovering trail running that I was also writing my PhD which is in Canadian sport history and I'm just reading the arguments of all these 19th century colonists embrace the winter the winter is the is the best season it's when canadians go out and prove our toughness right in order to get through the winter you got to think these are people without electricity right they don't have any of the modern conveniences that we have they're dealing with the exact same cold the exact same ice the exact same snow how did they do it like what were the mental tricks that they they used and time and time again it was uh exercise sports adventuring getting out getting out and just embracing the idea of the cold um they they learned this from the they learned this from the from the indigenous um as well like that the only way to make it through was to essentially like strap on and go for the ride like because you can't you can't you can't fight it so like there's all those elements of winter but there's also this like canadian mythology around the north and the cold and the winter so it was just like, if these guys in the 19th century and all the indigenous, like if they could do it, stop being so weak. Like you can go out in the cold for an hour and come back and have a nice hot shower and like, like, and completely forget that you even had, that there even was cold. You know what I mean? Um, and that really changed my perspective um, on the winter, on the winter as well. So there's a whole bunch of things. And now it's like, yeah, winter, the winter is, the winter is go time and, and, I love it. Yeah, that's super cool. But um, there's quite a few awesome things that you said there. I think that um, what you said about nature and and exercising in nature or just being out in nature, for me, I find that like I'm at my happiest and it's probably, maybe it's not even happiest. Maybe it's most peaceful when I'm mm -hmm. out in nature and I'm, it does, I don't have to be exercising. I can be, I mean, I can be walking. I don't have to be running or, or whatever it is, but there's, there's something there. Like there's some real calmness of, of being outside. Um, but then at the same time, you know, with what you're saying, like mother nature, but she's the greatest equalizer when it comes to almost anything. You know what I mean? Like you can be the toughest bastard in the world, but like 
you know, uh, running in the snow at minus 20 degrees is going to properly sort out the the men from the boys. That's for sure. And I think it's a, a great teacher. Absolutely. Like, um, and, and to respect her, you know, like I live by the beach and, uh, you know, when you go surfing, you, you realize, you know what, you've just got to respect the sea because <laughs> she can take you, you know, and, um, dump you and, and kind of like, you know, really teach you a few good lessons. Um, you know, just, uh, j- j- just with like a-, a wave that comes to her kind of naturally. Um, one of the, one of the things just to go back a little bit, actually, and this will lead us onto, onto kind of the, the next part is, uh, we had a, a guy on our podcast, Bo Miles. Um, I think, I think, you know, of him because I shared something of, of it in, in, in our group that we did, um, Australian guy. He was also actually a, a professor at a, at a university in Australia, but he, he talked about, um, what he wanted to teach his daughter. And um, he said, I don't want to teach my daughter happiness. I want to teach her fortitude. And, mm. you know, I was like, mm, that just kind of ties in nicely with what we're talking about. And, and, and it's, it's, it's so true, you know, like that fortitude will allow her to be happy in the future. Um, and then just this will lead us on, right? So he, he, used, he talked about the, the theory, or I don't know what the right word is, of phenomenology, which you've spoken about a lot too and I was like ah I know that word <laughs> um <laughs> I've heard you because uh, Bo Miles spoke about it and then obviously you speak about it too but maybe you can just tell us a little bit about you know you you're obviously an ex-professor um and you've done your PhD in um sports history and philosophy if I'm right um and like what 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 made you to choose that sort of subject mm, so yeah. Um, what made me choose sport history? I, I love, I, I'm a historian. Like that's how I was, I was, I'm a trained historian. Um, I've always been fascinated by the question, why do certain countries graft their national identity onto certain sports? I grew up in Canada. It's like the ever present question, like basically like what is Canadian identity? And the best answer that anybody can give is some with hockey right and it's just like is this true is this serious is this superficial uh and so that was like what i wanted to study now historians in like the classic history departments they think sport is kind of like a joke um they don't want to study it seriously they don't think it's worthy of study um so you've got to move into the old phys ed departments or what are now known as kinesiology departments um, where there's like a little niche field of sport historians that just look at the history and the evolution of, of sports and in many, many different ways. Uh, I was a trained historian, but I guess, I guess what I produced was more like a philosophy of history as opposed to like a detailed recording of like, here's what happened on this. Like I didn't do, I I didn't go and sift through records. What I did was I took already existing information and interpreted it in a new way, which is kind of like what a philo- what a philosopher does. Um, so that's like, that was my driving question basically. Um, and so then I, I studied when or what, when or how did this connection between Canadian national identity in the sport of ice hockey emerged and it's centered around the donation of the um what's now known as the Stanley Cup um which is the professional it's the it's the greatest professional sports trophy it's the greatest sports trophy in the world that, that in my in my estimation um sorry world cup that, that might be the second one but i think the Stanley Cup is the greatest it's the most it's the most mythic um because it has this incredible origin story being donated as like the national championship trophy of Canada. Um, And then it just outlasted and now is a professional trophy. And it's, it's one of the only trophies that you get your name on it. And it's, it's, it it grows over time. It's a really cool thing. Um, It's a really, it's a really cool thing in terms of, in terms of that. Um, But then I started to teach sport philosophy when I became a professor. And this is when I became more knowledgeable about uh, phenomenology because kinesiology, if you break down the word kinesiology, what it means is the study of the body in motion, right? Like uh, it comes from the Greek word kinesis. Um, So really phenomenology is a philosophy of 
of experience, right? When, when, when I say philosophy, most people think about like metaphysics or ontology or something like, like, like the definition of things, like what is truth? What is beauty? What is a microphone? Right? Like, and it's like, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions? How do we categorize things? Uh, those, those, those kinds of things. And that's, that's, that's all well and good for, um, for philosophy. Right. Um, but phenomenology is different. Instead of asking the question, like the first premise, what is the world made of, or how does the world work? It, it asks the question, uh, how do we experience the world? Right. Mm. So it's a very big, it's a very big difference. And what it does is it points us towards a subjective understanding of truth, as opposed to an objective understanding of truth. Like that there's a truth that's related from and through our experiences that isn't related to an objective set of facts, right? And that both of these planes of truth exist. And when we're thinking about like, how do we make meaning from bodily movement? It comes through the experiences that we have. So you're talking about the surfing experience that you have and gaining awareness of the power of the ocean, right? And then the respect, well, you would never understand that if you didn't have the body to teach you, right? You learn the lesson through the body and the way the body moves and interacts with the environment around it, right? And that in turn teaches you truth. It teaches you truth about the world. It teaches you truth about yourself. It teaches you truth about heck, even like the nature of reality, uh, if you want to go so, so deep. Um, and so phenomenology is really that understanding that experience can be just as powerful a generator of truth as rationality, essentially. Um, the way I used to explain this to my my students was by thinking about ice cream. So if we're thinking about metaphysics, like we're defining ice cream. What is what is what is ice cream? Well, ice cream is like a frozen treat, usually made with sugar and and different flavors and and based with heavy cream. Well, then it's like well, is sherbet ice cream, is sorbet ice cream, is gelato? Like now we're trying to figure out what fits in the box of ice cream and what doesn't, right? Phenomenology is like, what's the best flavor of ice cream? Mm, got you. Gareth, what's your favorite kind of ice? What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Yes, but that's a difficult one. I mean, I like ice cream a lot. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, let, let me go with that. It's very, yeah, it's got to be chocolates. I mean, it sounds, it sounds very boring, but, you know, I'm a massive chocolate fan. So you like chocolate, but you're wrong. You're wrong because the best flavor is my favorite flavor. And my, fa my favorite flavor, I don't know, is like maple walnut or something, right? It's like, well, who am I to tell you that your favorite isn't chocolate and who are you to tell me that maple walnut is in mine? So we're both right. Mm. There's a subjective truth that's related through our experience. Cause you've eaten ice cream. You've tried different flavors. You like this one. Somebody might not even have eaten ice cream, so they can't even answer the question. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there's a truth that's related through our experiences of the world. And that's essentially what phenomenology wants us to, to look at. And it's a way for us to appreciate our experiences in a very, in a very serious way. Um, it's what allows us to think about an embodied conception, mind, body, spirit, all is one. One of my favorite quotes that I, that I talk about and that I used to teach, um, I forget the, the, the sport philosopher it comes from, uh, it's not my quote, um, but it's, it's, it's powerful understanding. It's, we are not our bodies or, or we, or we do not live inside our bodies. We are our bodies. Right. Mm. Like we, there's a, there's a, there's a, a general thought out there in society that like the mind is more powerful or the mind is superior to the body. Right. It's, it's resultant of the scientific revolution and of processes of the enlightenment. It's the hundreds of years of intellectual development, but essentially it's like what goes on in the mind, the rationality, the logic, that is the most important element. That is the most important basis of truth. And anything else is just, it's just my, it's just minor. It's just, it's just minor. And lots of philosophies and theologies throughout world history, what they do is they subsume the body underneath the mind or they subsume the body un underneath the spirit. And this really leads to, it leads to a misunderstanding, I think, of the true conception of what a human is, which is an embodied conception, mind, body, and spirit all together. There's a really powerful history 
of of different cultures uh, forwarding forwarding this this idea. Um, and phenomenology is a way that we can understand uh, is a way that we can understand that, right? Another way that we can think about this, right? Objective truth is measured in let's just think about the temperature of the air, right? Objective truth says that it's 10 degrees Celsius outside. Okay. I'm just going to use the Northern hemisphere here. Sorry. Sorry, Gareth. No, um, I'm, t- I'm to Celsius as well, but so you, I'm with you. No, 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 <laughs> no, just in terms of like winter and summer. So oh, like, I got you, got you <laughs> in the, in, in the North 10 degrees Celsius or like what? 40 some odd degrees Fahrenheit in October or November. It's cold 10 degrees. You feel bad. You don't feel good. You're like reaching for your, we call them toques in Canada. You're putting your jacket on. Like you're, you're layering up 10 degrees feels bad. Six months later in March when it's spring and it's 10 degrees outside, you're like, can I wear shorts? Can I get my bathing suit on? I want to get a suntan right now. It feels completely different to you, but objectively it's the exact same temperature. What's different? In October or November, it's fall. You're going into the winter. In March, you're coming out of the you're coming out of the winter. Your body is acclimatized to the environment around you. Through those sensations, through those experiences in your body, it affects the way your mind comes to comes uh, into contact with that, that environment of making you feel optimistic or pessimistic or cold or or hot, and then that's going to affect your spirit in terms of your will, your determination. Uh, your your fortitude your your fortitude right it's all it's all connected and phenomenology as a philosophy of experience tells us this is actually really important stuff like this is this is not just trivial i'm gonna put a jacket on or not put a jacket on it's like the sun affects your mood because you feel the rays on your body you get the vitamin d right like there's a physiological, there's a psychological boost. Like we were talking about it right on this call, right? You're in Brazil, it's the summer, it's very hot, but you get this incredible sun all the time and you wake up and you see the sun and it just must make each day feel like the best day because you've got this connection to the way your body feels from the environment and it affects the way you think and then affects your spirit and your soul right and phenomenology is just a philosophy that allows us to explain this and allows us to present it as 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 serious if that that makes sense i really like the idea of um of phenomenology just thinking about it like it's it's a great teacher in many ways um and it's almost like how we should be experience or it is how we experience like our day-to-day and but but in in society people are not taking into account say the idea of phenomenology in in terms of like people that that people have different world views and different experiences and that sort of thing do you know what i mean like if we were more aware of this it, it would just be it would be a better place you know we'd be listening more we'd be whoa Whoop. <laughs> that's a that's a picture that I had on my on my wall that has just fallen down. So if you heard that, um all good. Um uh, adds to the experience of the podcast, that's for sure. Um so so yeah, so like I think um, you know, if people actually were more aware of what other people's worldviews are, like we would it, it, the world would be like a um just a better place, we'd be more respectful. You know, that's okay, cool. You've experienced that in that way, and I've experienced it in a different way, but actually both of them are okay. Is that is that kind of like have the same thing to do with phenomenology or or not really? I think a little bit, yeah. I think what it can do is it helps us empathize with people. You know, the thing that that, that flashed into my mind is just kind of like when when you're out, like just doing your day-to-day things and and you're interacting with somebody and that person is like maybe they're like a cashier or, or whatever, like you just interact and that person's a little rude. Like they're just a little curt and you just think like, well, that's, that's probably not the way you should act instead of just being like defaulting to your understanding of their, of their experience. Think like what causes me to act like that when I shouldn't, it's probably because I'm having a bad day. It's probably because I had a fight. 
with my spouse or whatever, or I had a trouble with my kid, or maybe it's a, I looked at my bank statement and it's not good. Like there's all these other stresses that go into everything that we do. Uh, and, and, and when we just stop to think of the experiences of others, we can, we can, when we stop to think about the experiences of, of others as akin to the experiences that we have ourselves and not elevating ourselves above the experiences of others, then I think that empathy and understanding can happen. Like, one of the funny things that I, I it, it's popped up in a few conversations recently, and I'm sure everybody else experiences this, but you know, we have these phones, right? We have these smartphones and people text you all the time on these smartphones, right? And this is not how it used to be in terms of like, you had a telephone you had an answering machine. If you tried to get in contact with somebody like a couple of decades ago, and they didn't immediately get back to you within one second, it was completely understood. But now it's like, I text somebody and if they don't get back to me in like an hour, they're ignoring me. They're a jerk. Like, like, who is this? Who is this person? Right. But at the same time, we've got a whole queue of messages that we ain't checked and we're not getting back to those people. But we were some we're so angry with that other person, yet we're so easily uh, forgiving of ourselves for doing the exact same thing. Right. So if we just like pause and give other people that little bit of that benefit of a doubt that we always give to ourselves because the brain always rationalizes away our bad behavior, right? I'm not a bad person. I don't act poorly. Maybe this behavior doesn't look good, but let me work backwards in my brain and try and justify it to myself so I can have a positive conception of who, of who I am, as opposed to having to do the hard work and being like, oh, shoot, like, I did bad and that wasn't good. And I should probably apologize. <laughs> people don't like, people don't like to do that. Right. We expect it from others, but we never demand it of ourselves. And so phenomenology uh, as a way to make the general experiences of our day-to-day -day lives more serious and more present in our conception and understanding of how we act and behave. I think it actually could lead to greater empathy and understanding towards people. I've never considered it. Uh, in that in that in that way before but I think you're I think I think you're right because when you focus on experience you are kind of forced into that orbit of oh shoot other people are experiencing things too and is it the same as me and if it's not maybe I should try to find out so that we can come to some sort of a a more a more calming ground is that kind of like what yeah. you were su suggesting exactly exactly yeah for sure uh, one other thing that you you were talking about was like the I guess the ranking of like mind, body, spirit, you know, and you were saying like that, that people, I forget who it was, but they were saying like, say the mind is, is higher than the, the body. But, and I've thought about this so many times, you know, like, uh, like what is it that sort of comes first, you know, say when you want to go for a run, is it my mind telling my body um, or is it my body going? And then, I was listening to a podcast ages ago. It was um, Rich Roll, and he was—I forget who he was talking to—but but they they said something, and ever since then, it's it's really stuck with me that action leads emotion, right? So you're lying in bed in the morning. It's six a.m. and your alarm goes off, and you're like, "Ah, oh, there's no ways I'm going right because I'm just tired, or whatever," and you just go back to bed. That action leads to you probably having a day where you're like, I don't know, you just don't have a great day because you didn't make that effort in the morning. But the opposite is very true as well. So your alarm goes off at 6 a.m. in the morning. You're like, right, I'm going to take action. I'm going to go for a run. And then after the run, you feel amazing, you know? So, but, but still, I guess, in which one is it that actually leads? Because you still make that decision with your mind, you know? But actually, it's your body which is maybe giving you the the long-term benefits it's a really interesting interesting sort of um theory isn't it like or, or you know which one is is yeah. higher in terms of ranking and and responsible for that sort of decision making so this is why it makes sense to view them all as one as separate parts of the same whole as opposed to cordoned off different literally different sections of of uh, of of who we are um they 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 blur they blur together and the more you understand this and the more you're able to identify which part is kind of acting in which moment and what's really powerful about this and this sort of forms the basis of my 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 coaching like um once you understand that you can identify which parts of you are weak 
And then you can combat that weakness by engaging the other two parts of you. Or if it's two parts that are weak, you can use one part to, to, to strengthen it, right? And it works in all directions. If the body is weak, you can use the spirit and the mind to, to, to make it strong, right? Like if you literally can't do a push-up, the body is weak, but you're like, by the end of the month, I'm going to, by the end of the month, like I'm going to be doing a push up, and you just, you think about how you're going to do it. Like maybe I just do push ups on my knees until I get strong enough to, to do like one push up. Right. And then you will yourself to do it. Like I'm just not quitting. I'm just not quitting. And then eventually the body becomes strong. Right. Eventually through engaging the mind and the spirit, the body becomes strong. If you want like a basic cheat sheet of how I think about like, what's doing what the body moves the mind thinks and analyzes and the spirit wills mm. right i like that That's i was gonna the- i was gonna ask you like where like what is the separation of spirit and mind because they're quite similar but not obviously yeah they're, they're yeah they're they are different they're different parts of us like the mind the mind will stop and the spirit will go on depending on your belief system right like that's what i believe the the soul is the everlasting part is the everlasting part of you right this the the soul and the spirit that's your will that's like your determination that's against all odds against all rationality i don't care it's not good it, the mind tells me don't go outside in negative 20 and sit in your shorts dumb you'll get frostbite it's going to be cold whatever and the spirit says I want to feel alive. I'm going out there. Right. And then the body moves. Right. So that's the big differentiator between, I think the mind and the, the mind and the, the spirit, the, the mind thinks and the spirit wills. It's just kind of like in your example of wanting to go for a run, if the mind was leading, you'd have kind of like a sheet in front of you when you got up and be like reasons I'm running today, better cardiovascular health, like, you, you know what I mean? Like you would be engaging this rational part of your brain and then you'd be like, you you know what? That's right. I'm thinking about all the reasons why and but boom, boom, cost benefit analysis. And that is very powerful. It's a very powerful thing in the mind, right? Um, but most people never actually engage the mind when they make a decision. It's the spirit. It's that emotion. It's like, I want to go for a run because I'm just going to feel great, right? Like, I don't care how far I'm going to go. I don't not working towards any goal. Um, my body might actually be sore because I went for a run yesterday, but I don't really care. I'm going for another run today because it feels great. Especially if like in your situation, it's like, it's a run out on the beach and you're getting like the salt water and the sun is coming up at the, like, mm, you could describe it with your mind, but you feel, you feel it with your soul. And that's what, that's what pulls me out to those sunrise uh, runs every single weekend. It's just like whatever I got to do throughout the entire week to make sure I can do that. I'm going to do it. So my mind and my spirit and my body are all aligned in making sure that this is the one thing that I'm going to get to do this week. Right. Um, But ultimately, ultimately it's like the three of them all in in, in conjunction. Um, It's a tricky one. It's a really tricky one to parse, to parse out. Um, because when, where, where does thinking stop and where does determination begin? It's like, <laughs> I yeah. don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know, but it's a good, it's a good rough idea as to like, which part of you is being engaged more. So um, just for like, just for like any of these big decisions or big challenges or big transformations or whatever, like all three parts of you are always being brought to bear you just have to be able to attune yourself to knowing which is which, what's strong, what's weak, and how do we counteract the weakness with the strength? Um, and that's, I've, I've experimented with this stuff myself, and I'm just a, I'm a firm believer that it's an unbeatable system to tackle any challenge or any adversity that you're, that you're dealing with is find the combination that's not, that find the imbalance in that, in that combination, you're going to find your solution. That's, mm. that's the, what I believe. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. It actually reminds me, um, and it's kind of a nice segue. I was listening to uh, David Goggins recently. He was on, on Joe Rogan and um, they were talking about two concepts and maybe we can, we can talk about both of them. Um, and, and they kind of also both 
they're not necessarily similar, but they, they, they are linked. He speaks about the difference between talent and mental toughness. So one of the things they were saying, like, there's like, there's some sportsmen that are like literally so talented, you know, like everything just comes to them supernaturally and they're, they're amazing, you know, but there's, there's also other athletes that are um, not as talented, but they have much more mental toughness. And there's a, there's a distinct sort of barrier, I guess, or line where your talent ends and your mental toughness takes over. And that's why I like a lot of really talented sportsmen, they never actually get as far as they should because they don't have that mental toughness. You know, they don't have that grit to, to take them to the next level. And it was really interesting saying that talent is sometimes a curse. Uh, do, you, do you have any kind of like thoughts on that in, in, in relation to sports or just life in general? Talent is the easy thing. So it's like when, like talent is like the body, we could think about it like talent in sport is the body. The body learns easily. The body knows what to do automatically. There's not a lot of conscious, I don't need to train as hard as the next guy to do it. it just comes it just comes literally out of my body right and so if you're an athlete and you don't have that natural talent well what do you do you do exactly what i was just saying you combine the other two parts of you to make sure that the body becomes stronger so you use your mind and say oh i gotta train right there's no chance rationally speaking i'm ever going to get to where i go unless i work harder than everybody else and then you got to work smart and you got to train in the correct ways, right? So you're probably looking for every single edge nutrition wise. Like you just need, you need that extra half percent point. You know what I mean? Like every little bit counts for you. So you're going to extract out every single advantage you can. And then you have to have the indomitable will to see through and be disciplined in ways that those naturally talented athletes can't, you know, and this isn't, it's not a knock on Usain Bolt because he actually, he actually has natural talent as a runner, but not as a sprinter, right? Um, he's a he's a natural. He 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 didn't even train in track and field in the hundred meter sprint. Like he had to relearn how to basically how to like run in order to to become the best hundred meter sprinter ever. You know what I mean? So I don't want to say like he's just like a he's just like a specimen who didn't have to train or whatever. But it's not tr it's because not true for Usain Bolt, but. Usain Bolt before he runs like a gold medal race in the Olympics, like he's slamming a hundred chicken McNuggets. Yeah, that's crazy. You, you know what I mean? Like that's what he does. He's got a reason. He's like, I don't trust food. I don't trust any other kind of food not to make me sick the next day in terms of like a GI issue. So I'm just going to eat the food that I know my, my body can handle, which is smart. But at the same time, it's like, if you're not like an actual, like physical specimen, you really think you're going to be performing your best by slamming a hundred chicken McNuggets before the day of your performance? No chance. Like you don't have, you don't have the, you don't have the um, leeway, right? You don't have that eh, percentage of going one way or the other. It's like, everything's got to be dialed, dialed in. Right. So in terms of talent versus mental fortitude, when you don't have the body, you have to, you have to create the indomitable will to become disciplined enough to, to reach those levels that realistically you probably shouldn't be able to reach. Um, but, but there are those amazing athletes. And then those, uh, those athletes oftentimes become the best coaches, right? Because it's, it's never the superstar player that becomes a really great coach or great teacher because they never had to learn anything. <laughs> Cause they're just like, it's like, you know, they use a hockey example, Wayne Gretzky, like, like the greatest hockey player or whatever. It was a terrible coach. And just because like his player comes to him is like, I'm having trouble struggling with this. And he's just like, oh, you'll figure it. You know, he, how's he going to teach this guy? Everything just came so, so, so easily, so naturally to his, to his body. Right. Um, so in terms of sports, yeah, like that's definitely a thing. Ta talent can definitely be a hindrance. And you see this all the time, like with at, like with athletes who are just told they're great. They always are beating everybody until you get to the pros. And then it's like, well, everybody is elite. And all of a sudden it's like, they can't hang. They, they don't have the work ethic to, 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 to improve themselves. And it's like all that promise that they're, they're gone. They're out of the league within a year or two. There's just countless, countless examples of, I had all the talent in the world and I coasted. And then when I really needed to work, I wasn't able to, cause I never learned, I never learned how. So it absolutely can be a detriment. And then on the flip side, the ones who become like the greatest of all time, 
they're the ones that combine those two. So not only do they have the natural talent in the body, but they also don't use that as an excuse to not to work hard. So you end up with like the Mamba mentality of Kobe Bryant or whatever, where it's like, well, I'm the most talented guy, but you know what? I'm also going to be the hardest working guy every single time out on the court. And when you combine those two together, that's when you get the transcendent athletes who just like, you don't even have to like, like basketball to be blown away by Michael Jordan, or you don't even have to like soccer to, to just be awe-inspired by Lionel Messi. You're just like, these yeah. are the these are the greatest of the great, right? And and that's why they're so rare. It's because when you've got the talent or when you've got strength in one area, it's just so easy to coast. This is a thing that happens to brainy people, academics. Oh, I'm so smart. All my teachers just tell me I'm the brightest person. I'm super smart. So it's like, why would I ever do anything silly like play sports or get in the gym or max out my body? Like, like it's the same, it's the same thing. People coast on talent in all areas of their life, right? Um, whether that's body or mind. And then what that ends up doing, the coasting affects your spirit because you become weak and you don't have that fortitude. You don't have that ability to 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 work hard or to face through the adversity. You're like you don't have the will. There's no will to get through something difficult. Um, which again is why if you're really good with the body you should probably focus up on your mind because it's going to be a weakness and it's going to sap you just like if you're really smart or you're really brainy or whatever, but you're never engaging the body. Eventually that's going to become your weakness and it's going to become your downfall too, because I could just think of a million reasons, a million examples of the Academy of really smart people having like jellyfish spines, all the, all the academics, for example, who are like, I don't agree with woke ideology takeover, but they shut up and they never say a darn word about it. And they just put out their darn research papers and they put their head down like it's not their responsibility, while the rest of us who want to stand up get our heads chopped off or whatever, right? Like, though, that's that to me is an unbelievable display of weakness that, that to be honest, if they, there are a lot of these people like where how do you find that they, they i've talked to these people they dm me how do you find the strength when i can't and i just want to tell them go to the gym yeah learn how to learn how to be on learn how to be comfortable and in, in discomfort and how to go through some adversity and get some get some will get some yeah. will right and that's that's a good that that's a good that's another good example of kind of a the phenomenon i think you're talking about and the, the distinction between talent and uh uh fortitude yeah, I like that, and I like I, I I agree so much with what you're saying about, like like you use the the um, example of the the professors, you know, being super sort of intellectual, but but not um, not physical. And and I remember like back in the day when I when I used to work, um, you know, as an investment bank, and I used to, you know, I used to work with these these amazingly incredibly smart people, but they were like seriously overweight, and I was like geez, if only you went to the gym, you know, like, you know, I mean, I, I don't think you've reached uh, like maybe a, a portion of your talent because you are like overweight and you're eating crap every single day. And it's, um, yeah, it's just amazing how, how people neglect uh, different parts of their, of their, you know, of their body and, or, or, or just neglect, like, you know, they might neglect their, their, uh, mind if they're super physical and it's it's really interesting um that we we should really be doing our best to keep all three of those fit um yeah so so the other other thing which was which we've we've actually spoken quite a quite a lot about so um he but i'll just mention it anyway he he spoke about the idea of performing without purpose and and what he means mm. by that is like like say for example we we'll use you right you go out trail running every single day okay and but you don't actually enter any race you're not you're not training for anything all you're doing is you just you're just flipping performing without any flipping sort of goal in mind you're just doing it and he's like and, and I was like I really like that you know he's like and that's where we need to get to um if we want to be I guess just if we want to grow if we want to get over our own demons if we want to whatever just go and do stuff you don't have a reason you know you don't have to have an event or something to train for just just try get to that level of of i guess motivation and then you flip and then you're going to be really i guess doing well in life so so yeah interesting but um i i just want to sort of 
you, you have your own academy now, the Fire Academy. And um, I, I want to just find out how you sort of bring what you do into kind of everyday life and, and how you are, you are helping people. Because I think the, the concept uh, is, is very unique and it's, it's different to pretty much anyone that, that I know. Like, so how, like what ideas, like how do you say get people back into doing exercise um like what what tools do you use you know this is just say one example of, of the fire academy and then we can when discuss a, you know some other things too so like how do you do sure. it like what do you do using your sports history and philosophy to get sort of people excited about exercising again or, or you know you know something like that so that's a great great question because i actually wanted to go back a little bit to what you were just talking about this uh performance without without purpose right and and what undergirds my entire philosophy about this is that there are different levels to like the idea of like motivation or whatever. So you see this a lot on, uh, on kind of like our side of Twitter or whatever, like that motivation is cheap. What you really need is discipline. And I think that's true. I think discipline is deeper than motivation. However, there are multiple ways that you can discipline yourself. Okay. Like we all know of like the coach, like the, the youth sports coach or like the teacher who's the absolute like dictator the punisher they use discipline right like you didn't hand in your homework you're writing on the board for an hour after class or whatever it's like oh you guys didn't do the drill i wanted we're 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 we're, we're just doing sprints for the next 20 minutes right i can punish you through discipline and i can get results i can absolutely get results through discipline but is it your best work no because there's likely a bit of resentment on the way that you're being treated by this person you're like, I don't need to be yelled at 100% of the time here. I don't need to be punished all the time, right? So dis- you can, discipline can become negative. Dis- you can become a bully to yourself, okay? Right? It's very easy to be like, I don't want to go to the gym, but discipline. I don't want to go to the gym, but discipline. I don't want to go to the gym, but discipline. Yeah, guess what? If all you're doing is disciplining yourself, guess what you're going to do the next time you start looking in the mirror? that resentment is going to start creeping in. You're going to start disliking yourself because you're being mean to yourself. All right. So discipline can drive results, but it doesn't drive the best kind of results because within discipline can also lie the seeds of resentment. So we've got to be careful that discipline doesn't become the overarching thing. What's deeper than discipline? Love. Love is the answer. Love is the answer to your question about how do you get to do something, perform without purpose, because you love to do it. Mm. And what do you what 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 are we what are we really saying now? What you need to be doing is playing. That's what he's talking about. Performing without purpose is playing. Play, by definition, is unserious, marked out boundary from the rest of the world that you do only for the sake of that activity. When I talk about a a toddler playing, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody knows what it means for a child to play, right? The problem is that when we grow up, we forget to play. Mm. And we forget to play in ways that are meaningful to us. So thinking about those bodily emotions, those bodily movements that I was talking about with phenomenology, something like going for a trail run just isn't a trail run anymore. If I'm being motivated by the love of motion, by the love of moving, I love to feel alive by running through the woods, jumping from boulder to boulder, jumping over roots, like making sure I'm not twisting ankles or falling down on legitimately like every single step. That's play to me because I'm not training for a race, right? I'm doing it just for the sake of the enjoyment of the activity, right? That's the only reason. And when you start to, when you start to use that love as your motivating factor, my gosh, the adversity you're willing to go through is unimaginable. This is why we love our spouses, despite the fact, you know, we stay with our spouses because we love them, yet we argue with them. We love our kids, but they're very difficult to deal with lots of the time when they don't, when they don't listen. Right. But you're willing to put up with all the hardship because you love that person and the love conquers all the adversity. 
So why not use this powerful, love might be the most powerful force, right? So why not use this most powerful force for positive transformation in your own life? So ultimately what I'm doing with my clients is I'm trying to focus them on love when it comes to understanding where they're weak and then engaging them through the love of an activity with their bodies to teach them the lessons that they need to learn through their mind or the, through their through their will. So ultimately it's like, here are some ways in which we can use the body. And again, it depends because each of my clients are different. Like I've got a... I have of one client whose whose spirit is kind of like dragging him down a little bit, right? Um, he doesn't have the will to do things that his mind knows he should, and that his body is clear, clear, clearly capable, clearly capable of doing, right? The first lesson that we had to go through was unfortunately a very difficult lesson. And it's only one that you can really go through when love is going to be the thing that comes out on the other side. And it's, you're responsible, dude. Mm -hmm. You're respond. You, you feel bad. You're responsible. And it's not like the blame is all real. And it's, it's, it, it might even be the fact that you've done nothing or what you think is nothing to contribute to your circumstance, but Thinking that way doesn't move you forward and hasn't moved this individual forward at all. So the alternative is then to look at the bad things that you do. Look at the weaknesses within yourself. And then we fix that through love. We fix that through, we fix that through love. We fix that through finding what's that thing that you would do just because you love to do it. And I focus on the body again, because it's, it can teach you the lessons that you need to know through the spirit and through the, and through, and, and through the mind. Um, so I don't want to get too like necessarily into the details just because it is a personal, like these are personal things that, that, that my clients deal with um, in mind and in body. Uh, sometimes it is just like a, I need to get moving. And it's, it's, and it's again, like, I'm not a fitness trainer, so I'm not like, here's your, here's, here's what you're going to do. You're going to lift, you're going to do these lifts and you're going to like, I, I don't do that. I don't program. I don't program you to do, to, I don't program your exercise routine. What I do is I'm like, well, we got to just make sure that you love moving your body. Like that's the, that's the number one thing that we got to do. What's something you love to do. And if you don't know what it is, let's go out and try it. Right. So I got a, a one client, uh, who's, who's getting into, uh, Muay Thai, like in a martial, in a martial arts, uh, as a way to just be like, I love doing this. It feels amazing. And what's so, so crucial about having love is that motivating factor as opposed to discipline. I like Muay Thai. Oh man, but I'm dead. I'm dog tired. Like 10 minutes into it. My cardio sucks. If I want to get better at this Muay, Muay Thai, because I really enjoy it. Maybe I should go for some runs. You know, I'd really, you know, I, I'd like to get more oomph behind my striking, but I'm kind of weak. Uh, maybe I got to go do the gym. So because you love the activity, you're now willing to put up with the adversity of doing the things you just don't want to do in order to become better at that thing you just love doing. I hate lifting weights. I do it because I understand if I want to be better at trail running, I have to have upper body strength to go up hills, to bound around, right? Um, so I do resistance training two to three times a week because I understand that in order to do the type of running that I like and to enjoy it the way I like to, I have to have, I got to have some muscle. Like I got to have some, I got to have some strength. Uh, and so the love of moving my body in one way is it, it allows me to discipline my body in another way. And I'm not being a bully to myself. I'm not being mean, right? I'm not just being that taskmaster who yells, you're weak. Like, which there is a, there, there are moments when you do need to be mean to yourself, where you do have to be that taskmaster, where discipline just has to come forward, kind of like what you were saying with the idea that action leads emotion. If you're disciplined, yeah, then the action will come first. You just have to make sure that it's not 100% punishment all the time, which is where I think people really get confused with discipline, which is why love is really the ultimate factor, because everybody understands when you love something, you're willing to suffer to see it through. Is it fair to say that... Um discipline can teach you to love so what i mean is like i have a friend mm. that uh i started 
like my mates and I, we always used to run in London, like every single morning. And then one morning his wife joined us and I remember she hated it. Right. <laughs> she was like, no. And then she's like, you guys go ahead. And we like, no, 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 don't worry. We don't care running slow. We're just going to, we're just chatting actually at the end of the day, we just love doing this because we really love chatting and we just run as a byproduct, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but what eventually happened is this lady, she now absolutely loves running, right? Like it's her release in the world. So I think, you know, the, the two, once again, it's like that um, mind, body, spirit, like which one, how did, where's that, where's the, the sort of, where the lines, where's the distinct lines in them? There, there isn't really, they're all connected and same, maybe, maybe a little bit with discipline and love, like, like you, you need the discipline sometimes to fall in love with something so it can work a little bit differently as well in that way. What do you think about that? Yes. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying discipline is not important. Discipline is extremely important. Like discipline, like when people say like motivation is cheap and discipline is what you need, they're right. Motivation is cheap. Like you're never motivated a hundred percent of the time to do the things that you need to do because they're hard and just, it's easier to do things that are easy than things that are hard. Um, and so discipline is very important. What, what I'm, what I'm simply suggesting is that love is more powerful than discipline in order in, in, in getting you through adversity. So the way I would think about that in terms of like this, this lady, um, she disciplined herself to start running, but I bet she started running more difficultly once she started to love it, if that makes sense. Yes, it makes so she sense. Came out, so she came out to run and then she realized it's not really the running that I like. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the anandamine that floods my brain uh, afterwards, which causes the runner's high. Everyone thinks it's dopamine, but it's not. It's not dopamine that goes into your brain, friends. It's not. Uh, it's it's a, actually a cannabinoid, a, a cannabinoid called anandamide that runs through your endocannabinoid system that floods into your brain to give you that fun, nice euphoric feeling. It's not dopamine. So it's so so when you get the runner's high, it's not that cheap dopamine heat hit that you think. You've actually earned this endogenous within yourself cannabinoid hit, um, which is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, which kind of leads back to that idea of like the phenomenology of of the mind, body, and spirit all coming together through exertion. Um, but it's like maybe maybe she found that she loved something about running and then she started to run longer and longer distances where it was just like oh gosh i'm just coming out to run the maybe it's like 5k or whatever like oh i'll just come out and run the 5k with you because i see you guys are getting it, but this really ugh, i don't like it but i i could be disciplined to run a 5k and then it's like when she falls in love it's like oh ne never mind like like where's the marathon like that's the difference that's the difference between discipline and love if that if that makes sense it makes perfect sense and that's exactly what what happens you know like now she's running marathons and, <laughs> i didn't have know, to know i didn't even have to know her i didn't even have to know her story to know how it works right <laughs> yeah exactly but exactly um so so bad just to kind of like maybe sort of start um sort of wrapping things up a little bit um just like i guess three kind of last questions um are there could you maybe mention say two either books or people that have either inspired you or change your change your thinking in life because i think there's so much we can learn from other people's experiences and like you know sometimes you'll go oh yes i should actually get that book or maybe i should follow that person like i think there's always like cool things uh, you know that that can help us develop new ideas in our own minds mm -hmm. yeah great question uh there's like so many um but the way the conversation's gone i'm gonna pick these these two uh so the first one is thomas soul who's just like the og um legend just like the coolest guy uh so when i was in universe when i was like in my undergrad and in my part of me and in my uh masters i was not i was of a different political persuasion i entered university as a communist okay um you know i talked about how i was a contrarian if you're not a country, if you, if you're not a communist at 17, you're not a real contrarian in, in my opinion. So like I was communist because I just was looking for the alternative, whatever I, I got moderated throughout that because communism is insane. Um, and as a historian, you just learn like, Ooh, wow, not good. So it's like, um, so I, I moderated to become basically like a milk toast centrist progressive, like just what everybody else was or what everybody else is. And this is still before the 
woke insanity kind of took over. Um, but then I, I started to, and I'm always interested in like, I'm always interested in iconoclasts and people who don't fit in. Right. Um, like, and so I started to read about economics because like, this was the time of the great recession, 2007, 2008. Everybody was really interested in monetary policy <laughs> and banking. It seems crazy, but like, that was like the thing everybody wanted to, to learn about. Um, and so I was learning about economics and looking at sort of like different perspectives and whatever. And I came across um, a politician who I thought like just couldn't exist in the world. And that was Ron Paul, who's a Republican, but who was arguing for something that I was passionate about, which was like drug legalization, because I was a progressive and that's a progressive thing. But it's like, how could a right wing person think that? It's like, so who is this person? So I got to know about this guy. That led me to like Austrian economics and, and more libertarian thought and thinking. And I've, I guess I've probably just always been a libertarian on the inside. I just didn't know it until I kind of synced, synced it up. Um, and so I was reading all these different people. And I came across Thomas Sowell and I read probably the most impactful book um, that changed the course of my thinking about my occupation and my career and what I was supposed to be doing with my life, which was uh, Intellectuals and Society. Incredible book. So I read that book in my first year of being a PhD student. And the thrust of that book is essentially people with PhDs are wrong all the time and nobody ever calls them to account. And they just continue to be wrong all the time. And here's a thousand examples from the past 120 years. And I was just like, wow. That's classic. It's like, wow. Um, being just an academic is a waste of time, essentially, is what I came to the conclusion of. It's like, if all you're doing is propagating ideas, then you're not going to be doing anything in the real world because you'll just be like one of these losers who just makes excuses for why their predictions are always wrong. Right. And you're not actually changing anything. And actually, you're making the world worse. You're corrupting the world. So when I read that book, I kind of like lost my, I kind of lost like the wide eyed, starry gaze about like being a PhD and an expert and a professor and knowledge is like the greatest thing in the world. Cause I was like, these are the smartest people. And all they do is wreck the world. Like all they do is wreck the world. Uh, and I don't want to be a part of that. And I can't, I can't possibly think that that's contributing. Uh, and so that really just like changed my attitude of what I was going to do with my knowledge and how I was going to apply it in people's lives. And that, that knowledge without application was, was worse than useless. It was, it was counterproductive. So that would be the first big influence on me, Thomas Sowell, intellectuals and society. Um, and then this idea of phenomenology or a subjective realm of truth and meaning and experience would probably be the next one. And there is no phenomenology book you can read because the phenomenologists are horrible. They're just the worst writers in the world. Like don't even try to read anything about phenomenology. It's, it's kind of useless. Doesn't like, it have like a German origin or something from memory? Um, it, hey? Ed, Ed, Edmund Husserl is the founder of the school of phenomenology and his works are impenetrable. And the way that the Academy works is instead of somebody raising their hand and saying, none of this makes any sense. Because if you do that, you become like a target of, well, you're just not smart enough to get it, right, dude? Like you're not like the rest. We we all get it. What's wrong with you? You're, you're a dummy. <laughs> so nobody ever raises their hand. So nobody knows what they're talking about, but everybody just is like, yeah, we know what we're saying. So there's a lot of like signaling in the absence of knowledge that kind of goes on in the academic world because people are too insecure to actually put their hand up and say, none of this makes sense, guys. None of this makes sense because then you'll be ostracized. You'll be, you, you, you risk the reputation of being a dummy and all your prestige and all your self-worth is in how freaking brilliant you are. So, so people don't ever go down that, go down, go down that road. So just don't read phenomenology. Just don't do it. Like phenomenology is awesome, but don't, don't try to learn about it from the phenomenologists themselves. They're horrible. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really, I really um, began to respect this idea a lot more when I read uh, The Sacred and the Profane by Iliada, uh, Mircea Iliadi, sorry, amazing book. What that book does is it is it maps out the universal behaviors and attitudes of religions across time and space. And they're usually like indigenous religions. So like primitive pagan cults and things like that. Um, and what it does, what The Sacred and the Profane does is it is it 
marks out this this distinction and this difference between like what goes on in the spiritual realm on earth and what goes on in like the temporal realm on, on earth and how this religious impulse is a universal element in humanity and it, it dictates far more of how we understand perceive and value the world than all of the objective data that's around us okay and that to me was just a powerful way to not only like understand the world but specifically to understand the particular and specific role of sport in society because through my historical understanding of sport and sort of my ability to map it onto different societies and civilizations and contexts i was able to uncover i shouldn't say yeah uncover is the right word like uncover it's it's already there i just brushing it brushing it back a little bit i didn't create this but it's something i uncover is that sports are religion they're not like religion they don't represent religion they are religion they they teach us about like the reasons why we're here, they help us to live in the world. They address moral problems. Like, like there, there's all of these really deep and and incredibly spiritual elements of sport that make it belong to the to the realm of the sacred, but not the realm of the profane. And that's how I understand it. When we see sports being like abused, like you know, kids specializing in sports at the age of like seven so that they can go pro or whatever right it's because now they're in the profane world they're in the world of occupation they're in the world of money they're in the world of business so they're being disabused and we're not able to extract the true value and the meaning of it it's the same thing as like as like commercializing a religion or something you know what i mean it's like there are the elements that are there but it's not the depth and it's not the 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 real it's like the coca-cola version of santa claus versus your midnight mass you know what i mean that's the yeah. difference that's the that's, that's the difference okay it's the difference and so that book was extraordinarily powerful in properly orienting the role of sport in the spiritual realm and then allowing us to access the subjective truth of our experiences in the seriousness of that world if that makes sense yeah it does but for sure and actually I got that book, uh, Sacred and Profane, uh, because you posted actually something on Twitter just re- just saying that this was one of the sort of biggest impacts in your life. Um, I haven't actually even opened it yet, so I must confess, um, <laughs> but, 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 but I definitely will. And I, I also, um, Thomas Swell, I think I got his autobiography. I haven't, also haven't opened that one, but um, I really, yeah, I mean, some of his his writings are, are definitely hugely impactful from, from what I've um, seen people talk about. Uh, so so yeah thanks for sharing those and then but um in terms of of you and say like your your business and and your future and stuff is there is there something you would like to to tell people about um is there something maybe exciting that you have coming up and um also how can actually people get in touch with you yeah absolutely so um i've made a clean break from my profession as a professor. So I'm out here on my own right now. Uh, So I have my Phi Academy, which is my own coaching and consulting business. So I coach individuals, again, people who are weak uh, and who need help getting back to a level of energy or back onto sort of like the road to their destiny that they deserve and that they believe that they're going to achieve, but they're, they're stuck or they're stopped, or they know that there's something more for them out there. Uh, and they're lacking that consistency in body usually or mind or spirit. So I, I, I coach individuals in a whole range of different areas. It's, it's funny. I was explaining it to somebody yesterday is like, it's kind of like pseudo psychology, except psychology itself is pseudo. So I think this is more real than psychology, right? Because psychology is, 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 is laden with, with jargon and babble. And then there's like an authority thing that's going on. Whereas like, let's get honest. Most guys, and it's mostly guys I work with, but it's not exclusive. Most guys can actually be a lot more vulnerable in a conversation like the one you and I are having than if there's a shrink. You know what I mean? Like, so it's an, I, it's like I'm a really great, I'm a really easy person to talk to. And when people are vulnerable with me, I build them back up very quickly. Uh, and that's what I used to do with my students. And that's what I do with my, with my clients. So if you just, are I would suggest attracted to the way that I speak or um record of like the warm affection that I have for 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 the ideas, then 
I'm, I'm a person who you can talk to about the deepest vulnerabilities that you have. And I'm going to build you back up to become the strongest version of yourself, much stronger than you were, even when you, you, you believed you were at your strongest. Uh, so I do that service uh, for individuals. I coach trainers. So if you're a physical trainer, like you, 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 you train clients, I work with you too. Uh, I work, this is the hat of one of my clients. Uh, you might see him on, on, on Twitter, uh, Ryan Dreyer. He runs tribal training, which like we are from the Zach Hommel group. Like he's the, he's the triathlon coach of all those strength guys. So he's like this amazing, amazing guy. But what I do is I teach him about the depth of philosophy and I teach him about the depth of history so that he better understands his role as a trainer He's better able to extract out his own philosophy of what he's doing. And then he's better able to communicate and, and get his clients to not only buy into what he's selling, but to really adhere to all of the things that they're not going to want to do in his training because it's de- triathlon training is demanding. Um, so I work with athletic, I work with, with athletic trainers and fitness trainers to essentially spread my message through their actions. Right. Um, and these are trainers who just they they're they're not the same trainers as everybody else. They don't care about your metrics. They care about you living a ha- like a good life, right? That's why they want you to exercise, right? There's there's no vanity. It's all about that that idea of love and adherence and what is it that makes people stick to a fitness plan, right? So so if you're a trainer, and that sounds like something you want to get in on. That's what that's what I do at the Fi Academy. Essentially, uh, you get in contact with me on Twitter um, at, at JB underscore Goldstein. Um, we DM. Uh, you can go to my website phiacademy.com. You can message me through that. Uh, I'm also launching out a group coaching project with one of our brothers from that group, Dylan Spina, who is the expert nutrition and just savage uh, of our of our tribe. Uh, we are launching a an online membership uh, club. Uh, it's a it's a membership where essentially we create the community that so many of us are lacking, right? We create a community where people get in, wanting to become the best versions of themselves. We use the inspiration of history, ancient mythology, the ancient athletes, and sort of a modern understanding of like mindfulness, nutrition, and like phenomenology. And that's what we do. So there's like a community with challenges. There's a community in terms of asking questions uh, from Dylan and I, because we're like the experts. We also provide educational resources. So I'm a former prof. Dylan is a former grad student in nutrition. So we're both like academic. We have this like desire to educate. So when you come into our club, you get access to courses that we create. You get access to group coaching that basically we're going to lead you through um, that, that uh, otherwise you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have access to. So there's a lot of cool things that go on inside the club, but it's all based around community, educating, inspiring based on a lot of the things that I've talked about and even more explicitly bringing in ancient stories, particular ideas of ancient philosophers. uh, And really that idea of like uncovering this ancient wisdom and this ancient knowledge that can provide so much uh, value in our lives, but without a community, there's just not, there's not that accountability and there's not that drive. So we're, we're, that's, that's what, that's what we aim to create. Um, and so we don't have the exact details right now. It should be very soon. So hopefully that can be done in like the show notes page or whatever. So hopefully by the time this goes live, all that information will be there. So I don't have a name or, or anything to drop right now, but Hopefully in the show notes, there will be a link for you guys to find out that club. Or if you just come to my Twitter, you'll, you'll know what I'm, you'll know about what we're doing then. Uh, so, so the easiest way to get in contact with me and find out what I'm doing is just come, come hit me up on Twitter. That's awesome. But uh, I see, I see that you guys have been catching up like a couple of times, obviously he's in the States and, and you're in Canada and he's come to visit you a couple of times, which is really cool. So, so you guys have put a lot of effort into that and, and I'm really excited about what it actually is and, and the service that you're offering um, because it's it's definitely very much needed. So so that's really cool. And like you said, I'll put all these details in, in the show notes so people can get in touch with you uh, when they wish. 
And then just the, the final question, bud, uh, which is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? <laughs> do you want a long answer or a short answer? Uh, it's your choice, my man. Let's do a short answer. I've talked a lot. <laughs> the meaning of being ridiculously human is doing things that make you feel alive. Too many people live as passengers. Too many people live as voyeurs in other people's experiences and other people's journeys. To be ridiculously human means feeling, means being alive. And what that means, a lot of the times, is putting yourself into really uncomfortable situations. Why do you think like those adrenaline junkies jump out of planes or jump off buildings? Why are they doing it? It's to feel the rush. It's to feel the adrenaline. It's to come close to the understanding of your own mortality and almost like laugh at it. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm, I'm alive. It's amazing. And I'm going to make the most of this by experiencing things that make me feel alive. That's why I go out into the snow because you shiver. It's real. There's no bloody escape from it. You're alive. The pain reminds you that you're still here, okay? That's what it means to me to be ridiculously human. And it's not just physical pain either. It's the emotional pain of being a parent, right? And having to teach a hard lesson to your kid when you would just rather give them candy and see them happy. You know what I mean? Because that's so easy, right? But that doesn't make you feel alive, right? Having the kid like scream in your face as you're trying to like, like that's live, like that's living. You know what I mean? Like don't run away from those experiences, like embrace them to their fullest because there will come a day. There will come a day where you will not be alive anymore. And just before that day, you're going to be looking back on all the other days that you were living. Okay. Being ridiculously human means doing things that make you feel alive. And for most people, a great way to remember what it feels like to be alive is to move your body in a way that you love. Go dance, go run, go play a sport, go do something where you're moving and you don't care at all about what is coming next other than the fact it's more of the same movement. That's what I'm talking about. Wow, brother. That's amazing, man. You definitely saved the best for last there. And uh, I really appreciate that. But uh, you've, you've been such an amazing guest. And I'm, I'm just really, really, really thankful that, uh, you know, that you're part of, of this relaunch of, of the podcast. And this was just such a fantastic chat. I mean, we, there's so many things that we didn't even talk about, but like that, uh, you know, <laughs> just like really that we missed out on almost, you know, that, that you're a true expert at that I've listened to you speak about. So, you know, at some point in the future, you know, it'll be, it'll be great to to have you on again, but I just want to say that I, I am, um, I'm truly grateful. You, you have a really unique way of, um, you know, spreading the message that you do and getting people excited and motivated to do things. And I think that's very special. And, uh, and I'm just really excited about, um, you know, your future, um, our future. And um, it's just been great to, to have you as, as a buddy and as a, as a podcast guest. So, so thanks very much, bud. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to just talk. And likewise, it's, you don't have to convince me to come in and, and talk and talk to you, brother. Like we've done it off. We've done it off podcast many, many, many times. And it's always a pleasure. And, we always, we always learn a lot. And so I'm just very happy to be a part of you relaunching this and being a part of, of, of your endeavors and your success. Um, because the best part of this social media tribe that we find ourselves in is like, we just want everybody to win. There's no competition. Everybody pushes everybody up. Even if we're potentially supposed to be competitors, we don't care about that. It's like, we just want to see everybody win. Um, and if you're sick and tired of everything being like division and divisive and conflict and crap, come with us, come find, come, come, come with our circle. And, and you'll see, you'll see that social media can be something completely different and it can be one of the most powerful and positive forces in your life. Um, so that would be my, my, my closing message because this, this relationship and this podcast would not be possible without social media. So, and I thought it was pretty good. So.
Yeah. And I value your, and I value your friendship a lot. Uh, so, so it's not trivial. So use it, use, use the power for good friends. Use the power for good.